Hello, this is the American Medical Association's COVID-19 update. Today, we're discussing Project First Line, a new initiative launched by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention that focuses on infection control. My guest today is Dr. Michael Bell, the Deputy Director of CDC's Division of Healthcare Quality Promotion and the lead physician on Project First Line in Atlanta. I'm Todd Unger, AMA's Chief Experience Officer in Chicago. Uh, Dr. Bell, can you begin by giving us a short explanation of what Project First Line is? Sure, thanks, Todd. Project First Line is a new training initiative that is intended to go beyond the much more high-level focused efforts uh, that we've made to date and actually reach all frontline healthcare, healthcare providers uh, across the country. So infection control always been critical, um, but probably never more important than right now. Can you tell us uh, why you started Project First Line at this very moment in time? Yes. Project First Line was created to address the fact that even though we've spent 20 or 30 years training many people in infection control, most of that training has gone to infection control professionals, uh, hospital epidemiologists, others who are experts in the field who were then expected to reach everyone else. In reality, our health system has become so broad and so complex that reaching everybody is not the simple effort that it used to be. I think back when most care happened in an acute care hospital, it was much easier to reach all of the staff in a systematic way. But with our dispersed healthcare delivery system, with a lot of care in nursing homes, rehab facilities, outpatient facilities, uh, we need to do a better job of reaching people. And so now with the um, clear crisis of COVID-19, combined with an impending flu season, we want to make sure that we've done everything we can to get the word out to people who need to know. What is your, your vision for this project? Well, so there's a, there's a good example from injection safety uh, that I like to use. Um, this is maybe 10 years ago that a clinician was noticed by his receptionist to have reused syringes to give a vaccine. And it was the receptionist who said, look, I, I think I've read in the paper that you're not supposed to do that. We need to call the health department. And sure enough, they had to do a big investigation. Fortunately, nobody caught hepatitis. Or anything. But it was that broad understanding of what's not okay. Another good example is smoking. If we walk into any hospital in the country right now and light up a cigarette, people will jump on us immediately. And not just the, the healthcare professionals in the facility, even patients and, and um, allied health staff would say, no, 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 you can't do that. And I want the same kind of broad understanding for infection control practices to be uh, present in all of the places where we deliver care. So you also have a, obviously a new set of tools at your disposal and a new kind of virtual world that we're existing in. You know, how do you use those to increase you know, the understanding of uh, transmission dynamics and not take for granted things like you just talked about? Well, I have to say that trying to reach literally millions of people at a time when we're not allowed to actually go see those people uh, is, is a crazy challenge. Uh, we estimate that there are upwards of six to 10 million uh, healthcare professionals that we need to reach. Uh, this is all nurses, um, nursing assistants, uh, receptionists, um, uh, technicians, radiology techs, dialysis techs, perfusionists, you name it. The, the vast number of people who we need to reach um, is, is one of the complicating factors. The other is how these people tend to work. If you think about those of us who are, are physicians and, and, and related professionals, we often have time set aside for us to do um, continuing education, to sit in on webinars, that kind of thing. Uh, unfortunately, that's not the case if you're a nursing assistant in a, in a long-term care facility. Um, added to that, the fact that after a 10 hour shift, the likelihood of somebody wanting to sit down for 45 minutes and view a webinar is pretty slim. And so acknowledging that and understanding that people need to be able to learn wherever they are, um, we have devised um, new modules that are portable um, using platforms, including things like YouTube videos, so that people can look at eight to 10 minute clips uh, on their smartphone, in the carpool, um, everybody else gets to listen, um, or, or while waiting for transportation. These are things that are intended to fit the lifestyles of the people we're trying to reach 
in a much broader way than the traditional professional education process. Well, you mentioned a couple of anecdotes up front, um, but talk a little bit more about how the CDC identified the need for a training collaborative like this. So one thing that's um, special, well, there are several things that are special, but one thing that I think is very important about Project First Line is that it's not just CDC uh, sending material out to the world. Uh, probably the most important uh, pillar of Project First Line is our partnerships. We have engaged a wide range of partner organizations. I won't go through the list, uh, but a, a very broad range addressing not only um, a variety of professional types, but also um, community locations, um, sort of linguistic subgroups, uh, realizing that whether you're on the West Coast or the East Coast will, to a large extent, determine what the language capabilities of many of your staff are. It's extremely different across the country. I've worked everywhere, not everywhere, but um, in all of the regions, more or less. And the extent to which Spanish is important in some places, um, Tagalog and, 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 and so on are, are important elsewhere. Um, the, 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 the mix is both wonderful, but also challenging. So having partners that can help us reach different groups and also help us understand different realities. We have uh, tribal health colleagues uh, that are helping us understand what the differences and variations are from region to region uh, for different populations who, who come from tribal orientations. So that, that rich blend of partnerships is another uh, important factor in what we're doing. And that's what has informed uh, a lot of what we're working on. We've done a lot of listening sessions um, and across the uh, country during the summer, heard from a range of health professionals and partners, understanding what they find both important or confusing so that we can uh, provide clarity um, and also target the areas that they're most concerned about. Well, we're here at the AMA are uh, excited to be one of those partners. And uh, uh, this afternoon at 1 p.m. Eastern time, you can see a Project First Line webinar and learn more about that. And subsequently, you can look at that on our AMA YouTube channel. Uh, Dr. Bell, tell us why why is now the right time to launch this initiative? Well, I've already mentioned COVID-19 and a flu season. Um, I'll share another pithy quote that I received from a gardening friend uh, who said that the best time to plant a tree is 20 years ago. The second best time is today. This is a large endeavor that I think has a lot of uh, value built into it. The sooner we get started, the better off we'll be. I think we have a very important opportunity right now, thanks to the willingness of AMA and other partners, um, that will allow us to reach the range of individuals that we really want to support. Our healthcare staff across the, the spectrum of healthcare are one of the most valuable resources we have in this country. These are people who uh, are willing to accept uh, terrible schedules, um, you know, all night of work, uh, being in the presence of infectious diseases like COVID, but many other infectious diseases as well. And they deserve to know how to protect themselves to the best uh, extent possible. Um, there should not be mystery behind what we're doing or what we're asking people to do. And I think that uh, getting to the point where everyone understands not only the what that you're supposed to do, but the why you're supposed to do it, the rationale behind recommendations is critical. If we look back, we've done a lot of training that focuses on these are the protective equipment that you're supposed to wear, or these are the five rules uh, of this or that. And that's okay, but understanding the reasoning behind that is what creates longevity of understanding and the ability to push that forward. Well, let's dig a little uh, in a little bit more on that. I mean, I think you are talking about, you know, you're going behind or beyond that kind of hypothetical and ensuring that the training is really relevant to daily activities in real life. Can you talk about some more details of the training in that regard? Sure. Well, so if, if we look at some of the early modules, uh, there, there are basic things like source control. Um, it's been in the press and people are, are using masks in public, but I don't think there's been a lot of attention on how this works and the extent to which it works. Having people understand what the rationale is for, for keeping a mask on, not only when you're with patients, but also when you're with colleagues. 
Um, COVID-19 modules are, are, are designed to accommodate the current needs of, of this pandemic. And as, as we look at transmission dynamics in healthcare facilities, we're seeing that there are asymptomatic carriers that can spread infection to their coworkers. This can happen in break rooms and cafeterias. Um, and so making sure that people understand that it's not just when you're with a patient that you need to be practicing source control, but that you need to be doing it all the time so that just in case you're infectious, you don't spread it to your coworkers. And similarly, they don't spread to you. I know it probably took years for uh, kind of hand hygiene to become part and parcel of everyday physician practices. And so there's a lot more to learn. Uh, what kind of tools are you providing to ensure that uh, there is kind of ongoing training and of existing and new people in these offices? So the, the tools that most people will immediately recognize will be um, the web-based or um, other portable um, video type training materials. There will be ancillary materials, including uh, training guides for trainers, um, annotated resources for the individuals who are responsible for uh, training programs within facilities and so on. The other piece of this is um, related to interactive sessions, again, leveraging our array of partners. The, um, the label tool might be a little bit uh, counterintuitive, but I, I look at it as an incredibly important process for generating understanding. Uh, we will be working closely with partners and relying on that extensive network to engage in a back and forth with uh, frontline healthcare personnel who can have questions discussed in live fora, uh, who can bring um, concerns that they have or that they're hearing about uh, to us to have an, uh, an open discussion and discuss why the approaches that we recommend are taken, um, again, what the rationale is behind that, and ways that you can maybe tailor those things to best fit the environment that you're working in. Well, if our webinar is any indication, uh, physicians have a lot of questions. Uh, so we're excited that you'll be able to address some of those uh, in the webinar this afternoon. Um, can you talk a little bit about your plans and overall goals for the project? You know, what does success look like for you? Success gets back to that vision of having a community across the spectrum of practice that truly understands the basics. Uh, I'm not asking people to become world's experts at infection control or infectious diseases. But I do want everyone to understand the basics. Um, unfortunately, we're, we're at a point where a lot of the basics of microbiology that used to be part of medical education uh, have been shortened or um, abbreviated almost out of existence, right? There used to be about three months of medical microbiology in med school curricula, and that is no longer the case. Similarly for nurses, aseptic technique and similar topics were at the core of training. And now, unfortunately, the amount of stuff everyone needs to know has grown so much that some of those basics have been kind of squeezed out the sides. And so getting us back to a point where everyone understands what unacceptable looks like um, and that everyone can perceive risk in a similar way. I want people to be able to walk into a setting, a patient room, an exam room, a waiting area, um, and immediately notice if something is wrong. Um, if there's a risk that needs to be addressed, I don't want it to be just the infection control professional, right, or the practice manager who gets it. I want everyone to be able to say, oh, that person is coughing. They shouldn't be sitting there in the waiting room with everyone else. Let's get them into a room right now. All right, very common sense stuff. Um, nothing um, terribly surprising, but having that consistency of understanding so that whether it's the environmental services staff um, who can point out that, oh, you know, that sharp implement should not be left there on the counter. Why don't I deal with that? Um, or our emergency services uh, providers who you know, need to be able to do a handoff in a way that is safe for them, uh, but also safe for the facility. Having everyone be on the same page and understand what the expectations are, I think is a very important factor. I'll add so, that it's amplified by the fact that, as I mentioned earlier, we are providing care in so many different locations. And the type of care that we're providing is rapidly escalating. What used to be 
pretty much intensive care unit based medicine is now often taking place on the wards. Right? We've gotten better at it. Um, the wards don't tend to be as well staffed as the ICU. And so that creates a little bit of risk. Some of what used to take place in the wards is now happening in long term care facilities. Long term care facilities often don't have the infection control resources or infrastructure that we would like to see. Um, take ambulatory surgery. Surgical procedures are growing in number in our country, but the number in uh, acute care hospitals is actually going down. So these are mostly outpatient ambulatory procedures. And if you're lucky enough to be in a place that's attached to a major hospital, then you might have those infrastructure pieces. But if you're a freestanding ambulatory surgery center, you might not. And so it's all the more important now that everyone in that kind of facility has the basic understanding that they need to keep patients safe and protect themselves. Well, so many things and so many reasons uh, to pay attention to this uh, with our lives and the lives of our healthcare workers on the line. Uh, thank you so much for all of the work on this and please uh, tune in today to the webinar uh, where we'll discuss Project First Line. You can register for that webinar on the AMA site or catch that on demand on our YouTube channel. Thanks so much, Dr. Bell, for being here today and sharing your perspective. That's it for this COVID-19 update. We'll be back with another segment soon. For additional information on COVID-19, visit ama-assn.org slash COVID-19. Thanks for being with us and please take care.